Hello and welcome back to Granberry Volunteer Fire Department's Online Fire Academy. I am Matt Hohan, Captain of Operations, and today we're going to cover basic vehicle extrication and training. Oddly enough, SFFMA does not have any certification requirements for Firefighter 1 and 2 from an extrication point of view because it's considered an addition to the training, kind of like rescue and boat ops and driver operator and so on and so forth. So we're going to go ahead and go through this because a lot of Granbury and a lot of Hood County needs a lot of vehicle extrication training and there's no better place to start than right here at our academy because we're going to go to a wrecker yard and we'll actually cut up a whole bunch of vehicles when we do the skills portion for this class at the record yard really important if you have any questions write them down ask members at your home department and the worst case scenario bring your questions right back here to the instructors other than that we're going to start this class objectives safe positioning of the apparatus initial size up and scene survey hazard mitigation and ultimately our extraction plan. These are going to be the subjects that we're going to cover throughout the course of our slideshow. Arrival and positioning, safe positioning of the apparatus. I feel relatively confident when I say this. Structure firefighting is very safe. Yes, I know you're running into a burning building that's being compromised and could be potentially on the verge of collapse at any second. There's no oxygen to breathe, but at least the temperatures aren't going to be blocked by sunblock. But there is an inherent safety in structure firefighting. You have gear, you have an air pack, and you have training. There's a lot of factors that we control on a structure fire. When we're positioning vehicles for a car accident, we're positioning our fire apparatus to actually block down the road and give us a safe operating zone. And that area is, that truck's going to work literally as a shield. Our most hazard commonplace scene, and it's one of our most common calls that we run, are traffic accidents. You have absolutely no control over what people are doing in their vehicle when they approach the scene, are near the scene, and ultimately pass and continue on beyond our scene. We want, if possible, to maintain an open corridor for traffic to travel through, but if the car that's in the accident is in the middle of the road, then it's in the middle of the road and everyone else can deal with it. I know people get really aggravated when they're sitting on a highway just dead still waiting for traffic to clear, but at the end of the day, it's not about them. It's about the firefighter's safety, doing the rescue, and truly about our victims that we're trying to rescue, potentially extricate, and ultimately save and send off to a hospital. Scene size up. When you first pull up on scene, okay, there is decisions that you will have to make before you even arrive. How many people are involved in the vehicles? How many types of vehicles are involved? Do we have a confirmed entrapment? Is there any known hazards? Power lines, hazmat, environmental. All of these factors can be potentially known before we make scene, and you need to be making a decision before you get on scene. If you have a school bus versus concrete truck, it's at two large vehicles with multiple patients. You very well could have a serious entrapment problem on that call. Another consideration, you have a fuel tanker that's been T-boned, by a small car that's jammed under the tank. Your hazards there are monumental, not to mention your potential environmental hazards. Once you finally arrive on scene, one of the most important things you can do is just look out the windshield of the truck and actually see what you have in front of you. Give an update on location. 
give an update on the problems that you see. Go ahead and tell dispatch and any arrival crews at what you're doing. And most importantly, any resources needed. I assure you, if you show up to that school bus versus concrete truck, you need more resources than one truck. You might as well get at least another truck from your station coming to your aid. More than likely, you probably need multiple departments at this point. It's okay to holler for help. Now, whoever takes command of the scene, they're going to do their size up and scene survey. And they're really looking at an outer and inner circle. And you can reference the picture for what I'm talking about. The outer circle is you're looking at additional vehicles, walk away or ejected patients, any potential hazards immediately not involved in the accident, and then that's where the staging is at, your backup for your inner circle firefighters working the scene. Your inner circle is considered your hot zone. In the hot zone, you need to check for hazards, number of patients, the condition, conditions of the patients, any entrapment problems, and then ultimately fluids leakage and what types of fluids are leaking. Do not touch the vehicles until the scene size up is complete. This is critical. This is where you're mitigating all your hazards and you're also noticing your hazards. Do not just run up to the vehicle. Make sure you walk around the vehicles real quick to get an idea of what's happening. Now, additional hazard mitigation that we can do. We can stabilize the vehicle at the wheels at the beginning. Chalk the wheels. Get at least an extinguisher on the ground and up there very close for the firefighters to use. I'd prefer to have a hose line on the ground to prevent any type of flash fires. Don't just get a dry hose line down. Get the truck and pump gear and get a hose line charged and ready to go. Use lots of lighting at night. The more lighting, the better. Not only does it help the firefighters while they're at performing any rescue duties on the actual scene, it also illuminates the firefighters to passing motorists. Get lighting on the scene. Tool and equipment staging. Do not take all your tools immediately to one side of the vehicle. It creates a tripping hazard immediately next to the vehicle. Get your tools staged a few yards away from the actual accident. And lastly, a debris removal area. The purpose of this is, is the same reason you don't want your tools on top of the accident. Get the debris that you cut away from the vehicle or get the debris that you move out of the roadway not on top of the accident and get it away so it's not a tripping hazard. Beware of airbags. Just because the power has been secured, it does not mean the vehicle is safe to work around. Electrical capacitors can hold a charge for over an hour after the power has been secured. Also, note, all vehicles are considered to have undeployed airbags until either all confirmed airbags have been deployed or until the power is secured to the vehicle and the capacitors have been discharged. Now, one thing I'm going to add to this real quick is how do you get those capacitors to discharge on those vehicles? If you have access to it, one of the easiest ways to do it is to take the negative battery cable and touch it to the positive post. Here's the issue. The vehicle's been involved in an accident. When you do that, you are intentionally shorting out the vehicle, and there is an incredibly small chance that you can deploy any other remaining airbags in the vehicle. But for ultimate firefighter safety, if you can, take that negative cable and touch it to the positive post, and that'll get the vehicle's power completely out. Attached, I have as a video and his encounter with a, fire, a firefighter with an airbag. Go ahead and watch that video. Electrical system. The use of power to your advantage of first. 
Does the vehicle have electronic seats? Does it have power windows? Does it have powered locks? If it does, get those seats moved and get those doors unlocked and get windows down beforehand so that you don't have to spend all this extra time screwing with this stuff when you're actually around the patient. Always remember to disconnect and cut the black cable first, the negative cable. If multiple batteries, do both black cables first, then disconnect and or cut the red cables. Confirm power shut down by turning on the flashers. You can turn on the flashers, you can turn on the headlights. Those are all multiple ways to verify that the power has actually been secured. The battery may be located in the trunk or under the rear seat or in the wheel wells. Unfortunately, it's 2017. Most vehicle manufacturers stuff a battery in unknown places anymore. I couldn't tell you how hard it is to find a a battery on a Mercedes or an Audi or on an electric vehicle. Once you have the scene prepped and secured and your safety established, it's now time to actually build an extrication plan. Formulate extrication plan of A, B, C. An example would be, A, we're going to open the window. B, we're going to pry open the door. And C, we're going to rapidly extricate the patient. Basis stabilization on the extrication plan. I want you to always remember to stabilize vehicles. Even if the vehicle's upright, chalk the wheels. If you look at the picture, the vehicles are on their sides. You have to stabilize the vehicle before you extricate. Period. There is no other way to do it. Only after an extrication plan has been decided can basic and advanced stabilization begin. Basic and advanced stabilization. Basic stabilization. Capture the patient compartment with four to six points. Advanced stabilization. The use of struts, tiebacks, and wreckers. Guys, we're going to this is a major skills portion of the day we practice extrication. We will cover stabilization in depth on that day. Patient access and management. Make verbal contact first. Give instructions. you got to remember, your patient just went through a really serious event, and this is going to rank really high on one of their worst days ever particularly if you're having to do an extrication. You need to tell them what you're doing. Even if they're barely conscious, tell them what you're doing. Tell them you're about to make a lot of noise and that there's going to be machinery working around them. Let them know if you're breaking glass. Let them know if you're going to be grabbing and touching them. Access points, doors or window. Break the window furthest from the patient to gain entry. You don't want to shatter glass into their face. Protect the patient when breaking the windows, if you can. After you gain access to the compartment, let's say you're going to gain access to the compartment just behind the driver's seat where the driver is pinned. Break the rear window and then take a blanket and physically drape it over the patient in the seat. And then you can proceed to break the driver window. Interior environment and stabilization. Address the patient condition, airway, breathing, and circulation. And assess if they're actually entrapped and how bad they're entrapped. Scan for airbags and keep clear of undeployed airbags. At this point, you need to secure the power on the vehicle if the airbag has not been tripped. Set brakes and turn off the ignition. I could not tell you how many accidents that I've worked and had someone do a full extrication and the vehicle was still running. Use power accessories to your advantage. Again, 
If the patient is pinned by the steering wheel or pushed up in the dash, use the electric power on the vehicle to move the patient back. Obviously be aware of how much pain that's potentially causing them. If it's causing a ton of pain, do not move the seat any further back until a further assessment is taken. At all times, cover the patient when you can. Take C-spine precautions and always communicate updates to Incident Command. Patient disentanglement or the extrication. Remove the vehicle from around the patient. Don't take your giant cutters and physically cut the patient's leg off because it's stuck. That's obviously a given, but you do need to realize, and I have seen this numerous times, there is going to be serious potential injuries to the patient's legs and or debris and objects jammed into the patient's legs. There has to be a given amount of take on that. Obviously, we're going to remove the, as much of the debris from around the patient as possible. There might be a time when you physically have to cut the object and leave the debris in the subject. It's just the way it works sometimes. Two considerations. Is there anything pinning the patient? And what path is the patient going to be removed from the vehicle? This is a huge, huge step to the actual extrication plan. Don't you dare just start cutting and moving objects and removing panels from the vehicle if you don't have a clue if the vehicle or if the patient is pinned or what way you're going to physically remove the patient from the vehicle. Protect the patient with soft and hard protection is needed. This is obviously just to help keep the patient calm, but also to cause any undue extra injuries to our victim. Some disentanglement options. Remove or cut the seat. Different types of airbags for different types of lifting. And then always roof removal. I rarely see people practice roof removal anymore. Roof removal is a fantastic way to gain immediate access to the patient, have a lot of people around the patient to help treat the patient, but also to protect the patient, and then ultimately to get the patient out. That way you don't have to remove the door, you can just physically lift the patient out of the vehicle. A final review of our objectives. Safe positioning of the apparatus, that's just to protect us on the accident scene and then also to protect the vehicle accident. We don't want to have a crash on top of a crash on top of a crash. Initial scene size up and scene survey, it's an absolute critical function to how you're going to find the hazards any extra potential patients, and then to ultimately start the actual extrication. Finally, hazard mitigation. You have to address the hazards as you encounter them. If the vehicle is T-boned into a live power line and the power poles broke and the power lines are dangling right over the top of the vehicle or on the vehicle, I hate to say it, but there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do until the power is physically secured to the vehicle. And you have to get the utility company out there to do that. Lastly, build your extrication plan. And finally, act on your extrication plan. Extrications can be a particularly wild experience. They can be from very basic to downright serious. And you're going to have all types of patients and different encounters as you're doing an extrication. In my personal experience, some of the best work that we've ever done on this fire department has been on vehicle accidents. I know that every single department in Hood County has terrible vehicle accidents every year. We don't care about the cause. But when we make scene, we are that patient's hope. 
It's not going to be DPS. It's not going to be the medics. It's not going to be the police or SO. We, the fire departments, are the ones that are actually equipped and can handle the extrication of the victim from the vehicle. Now, this was a pretty short slideshow. There's a lot to actually cover here when we go into the extrication skills. If you have any questions, concerns, or comments, again, write them down. Make sure you bring them to the class instructors and have these discussions inside your home department. Thank you for joining us tonight.